Hi everyone, I'm going to speak on solving the organ shortage. The United States has a very severe organ shortage. Approximately one American dies every hour because they can't get a life-saving transplant. Historically, the United States has emphasized deceased organ donation as a way to solve the organ shortage. Unfortunately, that strategy has failed. As you can see by this graph, back in 1990, it looked like we might be able to solve the organ shortage with organs from the recently deceased. But today, even if every American agreed to be an organ donor when they died, we wouldn't have anywhere enough organs to solve the organ shortage. So in recent years, U.S. policymakers have started to think about living organ donors as a way to fill the gap. In principle, that is a good idea, but we need to go about it the right way. Encouraging people to donate by promising them money or promising them perks or by creating educational campaigns that imply that people will feel better about themselves if they become living organ donors is the wrong way. That's because it borders on unethical to tempt people to participate in a broken system. The problem is we have something like a conspiracy of silence going on. The medical community, the media, and even living organ donors themselves tend to describe the ideal donor experience because they don't want to discourage people from donating. But by doing that, they create an atmosphere where policies are geared towards the ideal scenario and living organ donors aren't prepared when things don't go as expected. I'm going to focus on kidney donation because most living organ donors are giving up one of their two kidneys to save the life of another person. So what might be a bad scenario, a bad policy? Well, telling potential kidney donors that they can be back at work within 30 days would be a bad idea because it's really only true about the ideal donor. Someone who is young and healthy, who has a desk job, who doesn't have to do any heavy lifting at work or at home, who doesn't drive large distances, and who is not one of the kidney donors who has a 5 to 10 percent chance of having a complication that doesn't resolve within 30 days. So if you're not that ideal donor, you might be out of work for 60 or 90 days or longer. This wouldn't be so bad, except most kidney donors have to take unpaid leave and are using up their savings and going into debt, expecting to be back at work in a month. So when one month becomes two months or three months or longer, and my goodness, if there are medical bills on top of it all, it can mean financial disaster. The way it is supposed to work with medical bills is that the insurance company for the person who is getting the life-saving organ is supposed to pay all donation-related medical bills. But sometimes they deny coverage. And sometimes the donor's own insurance also denies coverage, claiming that living organ donation is elective surgery. So while the insurance companies duke it out, the donor is stuck with the bills. I volunteer for the American Living Organ Donor Fund, and I have seen a kidney donor end up homeless on the street because of medical bills. We do everything we can to help donors find financial assistance, including the federal program that helps with travel and lodging and other charities that help with post-donation expenses. But still, we only have enough funding to help maybe one in 10 of the donors who come to us for assistance. An important 
measure of success for any transplant policy is the number of organs made available for transplant. But when you're talking about living organ donors, you must also consider the donors and their well-being. Three years ago, I did a TED Med talk on paid kidney donation in Iran. I went to Iran because Iran was the only country in the world claiming to have solved its kidney shortage. Remember how in the US almost one person is dying every hour? Well, Iran claimed that it had no waiting list and no one dying. So I went to Iran, but unfortunately I found a lot of unhappy kidney donors. But in one city, Isfahan, the donors seem to be happier than elsewhere. In Isfahan, donors received extra health insurance, job services, non-interest loans, and other donation-related benefits. So I ended my TED Med by saying, we need to take a closer look at places like Isfahan, where the Iranian system seems to be working for donors, and try to parse the good from the bad. After my TED Med, Mike Middleman and I started the American Living Organ Donor Fund. And as I got to know U.S. organ donors better, I started to argue that we need to do right by these good people, whether it increases the number of organs for transplants or not. It's simply wrong to abandon living organ donors when things go wrong because of their organ donation. Now, Imagine my excitement when I learned that the Netherlands is now outperforming Iran in its living organ donor program by doing exactly what U.S. organ donors have been telling me they need. If the organ recipient's insurance doesn't pay, the donors has to. Donors are guaranteed their jobs back. Now remember, these are all things that don't exist in the United States, okay? So donors are guaranteed their jobs back. Donors get paid leave as much as they need. And there is a government program that helps with donation-related expenses, like travel, babysitting, and even extra psychological counseling. So now I say, forget Iran. <laughs> How can we be more like the Netherlands? Well, we can start by passing a law that prohibits insurance companies from treating living organ donation as elective surgery. That way, if an organ recipient's insurance doesn't pay, the donors will have to. Another option would be to find a private insurance product that protects living organ donors when things don't go as expected. There are a few policies out there intended for living organ donors, but unfortunately, they are all woefully inadequate. That doesn't mean some enterprising company couldn't come up with a worthwhile product. It just means one doesn't exist yet. Third, we could put all living organ donors on Medicare. This isn't as far-fetched as it may seem. Medicare is already paying for most donation surgeries and donor complications because the people getting the organs are on Medicare. So if Medicare covered all of a donor's health care instead of just the donation-related medical expenses, that would be one way to avoid the is this covered problem. If we put donors on Medicare for one or two years, that would be like Iran. If we put them on Medicare for life, that would be like the Netherlands. Since living organ donation has both potential short-term and potential long-term complications, it would provide more security for living organ donors if they received health care for life. Finally, we could create a federal fund that helps with medical expenses. We have such a fund for people who suffer from vaccine complications. We could do the same kind of thing for living organ donors. But whatever we do, 
whether the solution is a combination of these ideas or something different. We need to acknowledge that the current system is broken. We need to stop denying that things aren't going well for living organ donors and start focusing on fixing the situation. As the Netherlands has shown, we don't need to entice Americans to donate to solve our organ shortage. We just need to treat them fairly. <laughs>